I'm Louis Rosenberg uh, from Unanimous AI, and today I'm going to be talking about human swarms. So, as background, uh, the motivation for this particular project comes from the basic notion that groups are smart. And so, collective intelligence research has shown that groups can make very good estimations and predictions even when they're organized by crude methods. And by crude methods, I'm talking about polls, surveys, and votes, which is what we often use when we talk about the wisdom of crowds. And with polls, surveys, and votes, uh, the participants give discrete responses. Uh, those responses are then combined statistically after the fact. It's usually done at the end in a standard poll, survey, or vote, or it could be done sequentially in the types of polls you see online, like on Reddit or Facebook or Amazon, where uh, we're rating a book or a video or content on Reddit, where the, the votes come in over time with people upvoting or adding, uh, adding likes or adding stars or ratings. In all these cases, when you, when you do polls, surveys, or votes, what you get are basically crude results. Standard polling will reveal the average view held by a group, and actually sequential polling will actually give you skewed average views held by a group. And you might think sequential polling, because it's more interactive, would be better, but uh, a lot of recent research has shown that sequential polling is actually worse because of what's called social influence bias. Sometimes it's called herding, sometimes it's called snowballing, but the idea is that when the votes come in over time, each person is influenced by the vote that came before. And uh, a really uh, interesting study was done uh, two years ago at MIT and the University of Jerusalem where they showed that the first vote that comes in to uh, an upvoting system like Reddit will have a 25% influence on the final outcome. So if the first person upvotes something and then a thousand votes come, the end result will be 25% more likely to be to follow that first upvote. And so uh, sequential polling is really not a great way to make, uh, to make groups interactive online. And so all that said, polls, votes, and surveys are still really good at characterizing a population. They give a measure of the collective intelligence that a group has, but they don't enable an actual emergent collective intelligence. And so it's worth taking a step back and just asking, well, what is an intelligence? And I would say it's, it's something that makes decisions, solves problems, or forms opinions, and ideally it does it creatively. And so this is a process that happens over time <coughs> in a system, which reveals the problems with votes, surveys, and polls, which is there is no, there is no process. There's no deliberation. There's no, no assessing, no debating, no concluding. Uh, there's no negotiation in a poll, no give and take, no push and pull. Uh, there's no exploring of options, there's no finding of common ground, and ultimately it's not a system, it's a snapshot. To make matters worse, <coughs> polling is very often polarizing. And so when you, when you take a poll, what you're doing is you're revealing the differences among us, but you're doing nothing to help us actually make good decisions with those differences. And if anything, polls actually divide us. They, they drive entrenchment and stagnation, and they, they encourage people to actually get more attached to their views. And so polling and polarizing, although polling and, and, and uh, surveys and votes, while we often talk about it as revealing the wisdom of crowds, it's really not a great path for getting an emergent collective intelligence, which is why we started looking at, at human swarms as an alternative. And so why human swarms? It goes back to the same point, which is that groups are smart. And so collective intelligence does confirm that groups can make really good predictions and estimations and decisions together. And so the question is, well, can groups get smarter if we achieve, if, if we allow the group to actually organize as a system as opposed to just a snapshot in a polar survey? And so the question comes with, well, how should we organize a group into a system? And so looking at the problems with, with other collective intelligence methods, our view was we want the group to be interactive. We want the participants to be able to actually negotiate in real time, pushing and pulling, giving and taking. We want it to be synchronous, where the participants participate together at the same time, not provide their input slowly over time. That helps minimize bias, where the participants are actually responding for themselves, as opposed to just following a herd that's already in motion. We want to drive flexibility, where the groups will actually be encouraged to find common ground, and not just entrench, which is what polls generally do. And we want it to be convergent, where the group will actually explore a set of options and then ultimately make good decisions. What's really interesting is if you look at these, these goals, this is really how, how brains function at, at the highest level. It's a system that will take in 
if taken diverse set of input, and the participants in a brain are going to be neurons, they're going to push and pull on each other, and they're going to converge on a decision together in synchrony. <coughs> and that's where we get an emergent intelligence. It's also how swarms function. A swarm is also a system that processes diverse input in synchrony. The participants push and pull on each other. They converge on a decision together, and you get an emergent intelligence. And so a swarm, from our perspective, really operates as a brain of brains, which makes it a great model for, for looking at how to get a group to create a true collective intelligence. So how do we architect an online human swarm? We look to nature to honeybee swarms, uh, because honeybee swarms are actually great decision makers. They solve problems together as a system. They, they do this by collecting and sharing a, a diverse set of opinions. They weigh, they weigh many competing alternatives that are very complex to make their decision. They encourage flexibility among the group. They discourage entrenchment of the group. And their decisions are life and death. If they, if they don't make a good decision, the whole population dies. And they usually reach optimal decisions. The other thing that's really interesting about honey, honeybee swarms is they're very well studied. They've been studied in, in great detail since the 1950s. Uh, with, with some amazing research that I'll talk about. And so honeybee swarms make really complex decisions. Probably the most important decision that they make is where should we locate our new hive? And, um, and this happens every time a, a hive breaks off, uh, a swarm breaks off from a hive and needs to, to create a new hive. And when they do this, they're gonna consider dozens of alternative locations spread over 30 square miles. Each site's gonna be evaluated across numerous factors, the size, shape, of the, of the potential site, the ventilation, how weatherproof it is, very complex factors. They almost never get entrenched in a deadlock, because if they do have a deadlock, again, the swarm will die. They make the op optimal decision most of the time. And some amazing work by Thomas Seeley out of Cornell has shown that about at least 80% of the time, a honeybee swarm will arrive at the best possible solution of all the, all the options that they, that they come across in a 30 square mile radius. The decisions are actually made by manageably sized groups. Honeybee swarms, when they make a decision, it's 100 to 300 uh, of their most elder scout bees that, uh, that are most experienced to actually make the decision. And the process doesn't just get a decision, but it actually yields buy-in from the group. They're, they're not just coming to a decision, but they're coming to an agreement so that they all fly off to the same place, as opposed to them just scattering or, or breaking apart with different opinions. What's interesting when you look at honeybee swarms you realize that there's this fallacy of the hive mind. And you, you often hear people talk about the hive mind in this pejorative sense that you know, swarms are bad, it's a hive mind. What, what's really interesting is that people think that there's you know, 10,000 drone bees in a swarm and they make decisions as automatons and it's, it's, very, uh, it's very mechanical. And the truth is, decisions are actually made by about 200 to 300 experts in a swarm of bees and they're actually negotiating thoughtfully over a period of time and come to a decision. And what's ironic is you can compare that to how, how we humans vote. We humans will vote, if we're voting on a president, we'll have, uh, we'll have Democratic drones and Republican drones who will often vote <laughs> reflexively. And, and the decision that we make for president is actually made by a tiny margin of people who are, who are independents in the middle, and the decision is often by a tiny percent. Bees don't do that. Bees actually get a very large plurality, and they don't, they don't come into their vote with preconceptions, and so they are actually much less of a hive mind than, than people are in, in certain situations. So uh, this is what actual honeybee swarm looks like when it's going to make a decision about where they're going to locate a new hive. Uh, that'll be about 10,000 bees, 100 to 300 of the scout bees are going to go out, go searching for 30 square miles, and they're going to come back and they're going to present options to the group, and then the group is going to then converge on a decision among those options. And There'll be dozens of options that they might consider, and the way that they, the way that they express their options to the group is, is really interesting. They go out and when they, when they find sites, they'll, they'll actually vibrate their body in what's called a waggle dance, and a waggle dance actually encodes information for the rest of the swarm. It encodes the direction and distance to a site very, very accurately so that others can actually find that site in a 30 square mile radius. So they'll dance, it'll encode the direction and distance to a site, and it'll also encode the magnitude of conviction that they have <coughs> for that site. Because they might find a site and they might be lukewarm about it or they might be very excited about it. And so they'll do this waggle dance, and then when the bees 
a, a bunch of bees are, are dancing for different options and alternatives, they're basically going to go through a negotiation where factions are going to form and dissolve in support of different options, and, and a decision will be reached when a faction exceeds a certain quorum threshold. It's not just a simple majority, but actually a pretty big quorum, and then the group will decide, okay, that's, that's the site we're going to go we're going to go move to. And so you can actually, and this is work by Seeley, where he actually plotted out exactly how this decision gets made with factions forming and dissolving. And this is actually honeybee swarms. And uh, each of these arrows is a, is a group of honeybees basically pulling towards a different site. And so uh, based on their waggle dances, some will be looking for different sites. And these, these sites will actually change. And they're basically negotiating in real time over a period of time until eventually one site uh, gets a, a large quorum of support, and the decision is made. And so this is a, a actually very effective decision-making process that's distributed among a group of, of individuals. It reaches consensus, and so it's a great model to look at for how we humans could potentially make decisions in online swarms. And so, Let me go back. did that go on overnight? I, so at, at night they they stop because they can't uh, they they don't. They, they can't go out and investigate sites at night. They can't fly at night. Okay. And so they stop at night. So they just stopped at night. They stop at night and then they, they pick it back up in the morning. They remember where they were. Though. They remember where they were. Okay. It's actually, it's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, so enabling online human swarms, we, we look at honeybees as a model, and our design goals are to empower groups to work in synchrony as a real-time system, to enable the system to explore a set of options and converge on a solution, to encourage negotiation among these options, so we, can, we want to have factions that form and dissolve in real time to find the best solution for the group. We want to allow the, the members to be expressive so that they can convey both the option that they're, that they're in support of as well as a level of conviction for that option, just like honeybee swarms do. We want to promote flexibility where the groups will find common ground and not just be entrenched. The design challenges for us were that humans can't waggle dance. And so what we, what we need is an alternative architecture and, and interface for swarming. And the, the method that we came up with looks like this. And so what we do is we enable online uh, large groups of users to move this glass puck around uh, among a set of options where each user gets the control of a magnet. And they, they can apply their input, their will, with respect to where, what, where should that puck move to a particular option based on positioning a magnet uh, in real time, interactively, and the direction that the magnet is, is angled is their intent on where they want the puck to move, and the distance that the magnet is is their level of conviction. It's how much, how strongly they're pulling on that puck, and all the users do this in, in real time and synchrony to reach a, a decision. And we've developed an online platform to allow users to very easily come online form swarms and answer questions and make decisions uh, working this way. And so the platform that we developed is called UNU. It's a social platform for swarm intelligence. Uh, the login looks something like this, where uh, people can, can log in, form their own swarms, and then ask that swarm questions on any topic. We allow, we allow people to log in through all the major social networks so we can capture their information, their demographics, uh, and allow people to invite other people very quickly. Once they enter UNU, they come to a lobby that looks very familiar, but it's also very new. And so this is set up to look like a traditional chat room server or a multiplayer game server where there's lots of different rooms. But in this case, they're swarms. And so you can, uh, people can, can give a, an UNU, a swarm, a name and a theme. So here's a, an UNU that's the Academy Awards, and the theme is movies, and people can then enter that swarm and ask and answer questions with that group. People can create their own. Uh, they can give it a name, give it a theme. They can make it private with a password so that only people can come in, or they can make it public uh, so that anybody can come in. And then basically, somebody just clicks on a swarm, and then they enter. <coughs> and this is what an UNU space looks like, and each place is a, is a, a place to chat and swarm. And so it's set up so that Users can chat here, like a traditional chat room. They can, they can hold a conversation about any topic. Then they can ask a question here, and that question will then go out and synchrony to every member of the swarm, and it will show up. And then they swarm here to answer questions. 
it's great for, for answering questions, for making decisions, for making predictions, for generating ideas. Um, and so a question could be, who, who will win the Super Bowl? And so somebody will type in the question, who will win the Super Bowl? And then they can actually put in all their choices they want to show up. So they can enter a set of custom choices, enter the question, and then when they, they click ask, this shows up at the same time on everybody's screen. And these could be you know, hundreds of people who are all logged into this same swarm at the same time. And here there's a set of options. And then each user gets a magnet. And with this magnet, they can a a address their, apply their intent, their will, in where they think this puck should go. Now, while the answer is being, being decided, users only see the puck and their own magnet. They don't see all the other magnets because we don't want them to be influenced by what's happening, what the other magnets are doing. We just want them to be influenced by the global motion of the puck. Now, that said, users really like to see the swarm. So at the end of each, each question, they can click a replay button and actually see all the magnets moving and see how the whole swarm behaves. And so this is, uh, this is what the question would look like. And this is an actual replay of all the, all the swarm, all the magnets. It says, who's going to win the Super Bowl? And then we'll see the swarm act. So this is a relatively small group. They're starting to pull first towards the 49ers. But then a faction forms pulling it back towards the Patriots. It can't quite get there. There's, there's a group pulling towards the Packers. But ultimately, they reach a decision that's the Patriots. And what's interesting about this swarm is we did this about a month before the before even the playoffs had been played last year, and, and they, this group had predicted the Patriots. And at the end, I'll talk about how swarms are actually really good at making predictions. Uh, they outperform, in our, in our studies, outperform polls and surveys uh, all the time. How do you determine what's in that square called brain power? Uh, so brain power is a measure of how quickly the swarm uh, comes to a decision. And so uh, a dysfunctional swarm will not even will, if everybody's just pulling in opposite directions, the puck will just won't move. And uh, it's not it, the brain power of the users. It's not the brain power. Of the users. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's going to be the Broncos. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a measure of how well the group works together. Uh, and a dysfunctional group. Will, will, and we only, if you might have noticed, we only get 60 seconds for each group to make an answer. And that actually applies time pressure, so that if, as the time starts running out, it basically forces a prisoner's dilemma, where either they will just fail as a group, or they will be flexible and reach decisions. So in addition to just, in addition to asking, uh, allowing people to ask text, text questions, they can attach an image to any question. That image pops up with their question. We can also do ranges where there could be a range. In this case, it's a range from zero to $25. What's a fair price for a movie ticket? In fact, this is a question that we ask all the time. We've asked it probably to 20 different swarms, and we always get an answer around $6.50 for what's the fair price for a movie ticket. Mm. Um, but these answers can be uh, between, uh, actually, David's probably upset with me, because I think he was going to ask this group. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to come up with something. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, we might be different. <laughs> uh, so, um, so it's between zero and twenty-five dollars, and so you, but you can make any range of numbers. We can do numbers, prices, point spreads. We have people do. We, a lot of people are interested in, in predicting outcomes of sporting events, and they'll look at the point spread. Um, we can do ratings or rankings. In addition uh, to you giving six options, we can also uh, you can ask a question and put it in suggestion mode. And so now you're polling the swarm for suggestions. And so now that it's, it's as if the swarm is is like actual scout bees that are going out and looking for options. And so, uh, now this goes back to the question we got where, what if there's a lot of options? Now, if we have a big swarm of 50 people, we might get more than six options. Problem is that people are not very good at making decisions among more than five or six alternatives. And so we only present six at one time, and so the first six choices that come in will fill, will populate, and you, you can say, uh, where should we go for dinner? And six choices can come up, and we can pick one. And then, uh, at the end of that type of question, a little button comes up that says, we can top that. And if enough pe members of the swarm think that we can top that answer, the answer might have been Chinese food, and if they think, oh, we can top Chinese food, then the question repeats, putting Chinese food in one of the choices and giving the group an option to then refill. And so you could go, if, you ha if there are 15 or 20 options that the swarm has, it will just go through a s three or four sets of six. And so the group can go as long as they want Usually they run out of options pretty quick because they, they're overlapping what other people would have come up with, or they realize somebody else came up with something better, and so they, they save their option. But it allows for an unlimited number of options uh, through iterations. And so also groups can be big. I showed a swarm of, of 12 people. Here's a larger group of uh, 
This is a question we did just a couple weeks ago to a real swarm of, uh, I think it's over 100 people who would be the best to stand up with, to Vladimir Putin. They provided these suggestions, and then um, the group is breaking up into factions, and it, you, can, you can see some of these factions forming, and this Bernie Sanders faction Polls and Lance, which surprised us, came out, came out Bernie Sanders. Now, this goes back to the question we got, which is, well, does the placement of these things make a difference? Like, right here, you have Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders next to each other, and so the Democrats are probably pulling on this, and the Republicans are probably pulling here on Donald Trump, and, you know, did that make it either unfair or, like, did that change the outcome that it would have been? And what's interesting is we can look at the, that actually doesn't happen. And so, the outcomes we're seeing are robust really for two reasons, and I'll show some diagrams why. First, swarms are adaptive, and so it's not, when, if you think about it as a poll or a vote, then you can say, oh, well, uh, that could be unfair. But the swarms are adaptive, meaning the swarms will, might take different routes to get to a particular answer, but the people who are participating will actually alter their strategy in real time to avoid some of these problems that you're imagining based on position. And um, and then we've also added something we call artificial gravity, which I'll explain, which helps avoid some of these uh, some of these position biases. And it's best to look at a picture to understand it. So here is this Clinton-Sanders-Trump situation. And you can imagine, okay, let's say I have Clinton and Sanders splitting the Democratic part of this population, and the Republican part is not split. You'd say, well, Trump has an advantage, because these guys are split. <coughs> and he can, he can pull the puck over. But what, what you see in practice is as this puck starts to move towards Trump, these guys change their strategy from pulling towards their choice to defending against Trump, who they don't want to, to have. And so these, these, two, these two factions will come together, defend against Trump, and pull the puck back away. But then as it gets away, they'll split again into their factions. And so what will happen is you'll reach this impasse. You'll reach this, this deadlock situation where all the force is balanced, and you're not going to get to an answer unless some of these Clinton people switch, switch to the Sanders faction or the, faction, or the Sanders people switch to the, to the Clinton faction. And we're actually seeing a lot of those switching happening in real time. We're seeing in real time lots of switches happening. In this case, we saw the switch pulling to Sanders, and the group went there. Now, you can imagine it could be even worse if, this, if it, ha it had to been, happened to have been laid out this way. Now here you see, well, now Trump has an even bigger advantage because the Sanders people and the Clinton people are actually like awesome. balancing each other out, and it, and it can actually swing through. And what happens is when you see it like this, is you, you get the same answer, but it just, the impasse happens in a different place. And so the puck will actually get closer to Trump um, than it would have, but these people still switch and change their strategy defending, and then ultimately they come to a decision amongst themselves, and it goes to Sanders. Now the one case where it's, it becomes problematic is when it looks like this. Where, the, where an option is actually between the other two, and here the puck can get really, really close to Trump because these guys are actually, there's a, there's a component of force actually helping Trump, and then there's a component that actually cancel each other out, and so the puck gets really, really close, and it gets so close that it could, it, because the puck has inertia, it could actually get to Trump as an artifact of slingshotting in there. And what we've done is we've introduced artificial gravity that always pulls the puck, is a force that's always pulling the puck board back towards center. <coughs> and so it, it creates a, a certain number, a certain amount of, uh, of basically a, a, a certain size quorum that has to be overcome for the puck to actually get to, to any of the answers. And so what happens here is the artificial gravity just brings that, that deadlock position a little bit closer to center, and so that the group has a chance to work it out amongst themselves without it just slingshotting onto an answer. So yeah. Have a potential field of attraction that attracts the puck back towards yes. the center. And uh, you're assuming basically that all the individuals have equal weight, but it, they do but have. E so that's a great question. Do they do they have equal weight? And currently they do. We've we've built the system so that they could have very different weights. What we found from users is that when we start introducing that, they don't like that. And so this is really just more of an issue of. A part of this is, is being able to make the, the participants in the swarm find this to be a fun experience, because otherwise we won't get participants. And, and we, didn't, we didn't know people would really object to, to, un, to swarms that were not equally weighted. But one of the attractions that people have when they do this is they feel like it's a very democratic and fair way to, to reach decisions, and they actually feel empowered. 
to make a decision this way, where because this gets rid of some of the hierarchical problems of, of organizational decision making. And so currently we're doing equal weighting, but we can, and it's all the me mechanics are built in there to, to allow special weighting of different people based on, for example, their, if they're particularly good at question answerers, they can be weighted more. 